Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I'm Dr. Rhys Grant and I am the Science Communication Specialist here in the Biochemistry Department, shared also with the Cell and Molecular Biology Program at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre at Cambridge University. So for this 2021 Cambridge Festival talk, I am joined by two fantastic speakers. So firstly, we have Dr. Bill Broadhurst, who is a university lecturer in our department. And then secondly, but by no means least, we have Dr. Daniel Nietlesbach, who is a reader in our department. I'm also joined, as always, by Latika Sugumba, who is part of our department's secretariat team. And Latika is gonna be helping me out this afternoon behind the scenes with running this online event. So for this afternoon's talk, Bill and Daniel are going to be speaking to us about the research applications of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR for short. So firstly, Bill's going to explore soil bacteria and how they may hold the key to solving the problem of antibiotic resistance. And then Daniel is going to discuss how understanding how human sensor proteins work and how they interact with drugs can help us to develop new methods to tackle disease. But before we get on to anything NMR related, the first thing I'd like to ask you all to please do is click the subscribe button down below so that you can follow our YouTube channel because we have more talks coming up this week for the Cambridge Festival and we're also planning on bringing you more live content directly from our department in the near future. I'd also encourage you all to please go and check out our other social media channels on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, using our handle at CAMBIOCHEM. So that's C-A-M-B-I-O-C-H-E-M, because we use these channels to tell you about all of our news, all of our research, our teaching, and everything really that goes on in our department. I also just want to mention that after the talk this afternoon, Bill, Daniel, Latika, and myself will be having a live question and answer session. So if you've got any questions on the talk, or maybe if you just have any more general questions about NMR and its applications, if you could please post these questions in the live chat on YouTube, and then the four of us will stay for about 15 minutes after the talk to answer as many of your questions as we can get through. You don't need to worry if you participate in the Q&A about being seen on camera or being heard because it would just be me reading your questions out anonymously on your behalf. So as I mentioned, our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Bill Broadhurst. So after reading chemistry at the University of Oxford and then working on the effects of magnetic fields on free radical reactions for his DPhil, Bill joined our department as a postdoctoral researcher in 1992. Bill was appointed as Assistant Director of Research in NMR Spectroscopy in 1995, and then as a university lecturer in 2015. Bill's current research uses structural biology tools to understand how bacteria make complex natural product molecules, such as the antibiotic erythromycin and the toxin mycolactone. Our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. Daniel Nietlesbach. So Daniel trained as a chemist and he completed his PhD in Zurich in Switzerland before he joined the University of Cambridge where he's since transitioned more and more towards biological work over the last 27 years. As a structural biologist, Daniel enjoys exploring the molecular diversity of life and together with his research group, he's studying proteins down to atomic level resolution. Daniel's currently a reader in our department, and he's also the manager of our department's NMR facility. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Bill to start off this afternoon's session. So thank you very much, Bill. Great, so let me uh, share my screen and uh, we'll launch my uh, presentation. Okay, here we go. Good. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, Daniel and I have chosen the title NMR Drugs and Targets. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about using NMR spectroscopy to learn about how antibiotics are made. And then Daniel is going to tell you about cell surface receptor proteins, many of which are important drug targets. 
So what makes a good antibiotic? Every bacterium needs, to co needs a complete DNA blueprint that contains all of the instructions required for making a new cell. So good ways of killing bacteria include interfering with the nucleic acid synthesis or disrupting the replication and separation of DNA. And that's what the drugs trimethoprim and quinolone drugs can do. And next, the information that's stored in the DNA genome has to be read in a process called transcription that involves making a long strand of messenger RNA. Transcription can be interrupted by the drug rifamycin, which inhibits the RNA polymerase. And next, the RNA message needs to be converted into a nanoscale molecular machine that can actually do something. In other words, a protein in a process called translation that is catalyzed by the ribosome. And the ribosome can be blocked by erythromycin. Now, proteins do all kinds of different jobs inside cells. Some of those proteins are enzymes that catalyze important biochemical reactions. For example, the enzymes that synthesize components of the bacterium's cell wall. Now, penicillin gums up that those enzymes, disrupting cell wall synthesis so that the bacterium bursts open and then dies. Now, because we haven't always used antibiotic drugs wisely, multidrug resistant pathogens have become a huge problem for 21st century healthcare. And resistance can be developed in many different ways. So for example, a bacteria might learn how to make an enzyme that reacts with our favorite drug, rendering it harmless. Or the antibiotic, uh, sorry, the target of an antibiotic might acquire mutations that prevent the drug from binding to it, so the drug becomes useless. Alternatively, the bacterium might start blocking the pathways that drugs use to enter the cell, or it could even develop super efficient efflux pumps that can spit drugs out as soon as they get inside. Now, whenever humans use antibiotics, it's inevitable that antibiotic resistance will occur. That's because bacteria reproduce themselves much more rapidly than we do. Each time their genome is copied, tiny mistakes that we call mutations can be made. And sooner or later, one of those mutations will enable a bacterium to avoid being killed by our favorite antibiotic. And that will give the resistant bacterium a competitive advantage, meaning that its daughter cells and then its granddaughters and great granddaughters will take over while their unmutated cousins die off. And that's why the world is in desperate need of new antibiotics. Currently, even in this age of coronavirus, about a quarter of all the deaths that occur across the world each year are due to microbial infections. And it also turns out that the economics of producing antibi antibiotics have broken down. Because resistance to antibiotics occurs so quickly that they can't make a profit by introducing new drugs, pharmaceutical companies are no longer interested in making antibiotics. Resistant bacteria, it turns out, can only really be killed by using new classes of antibiotic, but there aren't any more that are left in the pipeline. So imagine what life will be like when none of our antibiotics work anymore. Caesarean sections, hip replacements and other routine operations will become too risky to attempt. Obviously, the problem of finding new antibiotics needs a rethink. Well, it turns out that a large proportion of small molecule therapeutics originally come from soil bacteria, including all sorts of antibacterial agents, antifungals, and even anti-cancer drugs. In fact, more than two thirds of clinically used antibiotics are natural products that are produced by just one type of soil bacteria, the Actinomycetes family. Now, one of these soil bacterium antibiotics is erythromycin. It's a polyketide that's formed by fusing seven carboxylic acid molecules together to form a ring. Erythromycin works by inhibiting bacterial ribosomes, those enzymes that synthesize new proteins. 
and it's used to treat respiratory diseases like bronchitis, whooping cough and pneumonia. Now, erythromycin is produced by a bacterium called Saccharopolyspora erythrea using a series of enzymes. And in general, enzymes work by bringing all of the necessary raw materials together in one place, by creating a favorable environment for reactions to occur, and then by stretching, bending, or twisting substrate molecules to make it easier for the reaction to proceed. When combined, those properties can speed up biochemical reactions so efficiently that they occur millions of times faster than they would do if the enzyme was absent. And the enzymes that Erythrea uses to make erythromycin turn out to have another more unusual feature as well. They behave like factory assembly lines where basic components are loaded onto a conveyor belt, joined together, adjusted, and then passed along to the next workstation in order to be extended, adjusted, and passed along once again. So here's a schematic, a button diagram of the factory enzyme that makes erythromycin. As a whole, this enzyme is called 6-deoxyerythronolide B synthase, but fortunately it's called DEBS for short. Now, it consists of three long polypeptide chains, DEBS1, DEBS2 and DEBS3. And each of those chains contains several modules, which are covalently linked groups of enzymes that recruit extender units from inside the cell, fuse them together, chemically transform the products using reduction reactions, and then pass the growing substrate chain along to the next module where the whole process can happen again. So let me show you how it works. We begin by loading a starter unit and the first module of DEBS fuses this to an extender unit. And then the second module selects an, another extender unit and fuses it to what we've already got. And then the same thing happens again and again and again and again. And then finally, the last enzyme domain in DEBS3 releases the substrate chain and joins up the ends to make a circular structure. And after that, the polyketide core that we've made gets decorated with a few sugar molecules and then it's job done. Now, the genes that act as the DNA blueprint for making DEBS1, DEBS2 and DEBS3 all appear close together in the genome of Saccharopolyspora erythrea in a feature that we call a biosynthetic cluster, along with all of the extra genes that are required for, for example, decorating the polyketide product with sugar molecules. Now from the DNA sequence, it's not hard to predict the sequence in which amino acids will appear in the protein that the gene codes for. However, for repetitive factory enzymes, it's possible to go much further. The number of modules that we detect in a gene cluster can tell us how many extender units and of which sort are going to get fused together in the final natural product. And it will also tell us the order in which those reactions have to occur. So overall, it looks like we should be able to predict the fine details of the chemical structure of a natural product just by learning about the DNA sequence of a new biosynthetic cluster. And that suggests some exciting synthetic biology experiments. Perhaps we could make our own new designer natural products by cutting and pasting together the DNA for different modules. So for example, what would happen if we take the DNA for the loading domain and the first module of DEBS1 and fuse that to the DNA from the first module of DEBS2, and then finish off with the substrate release domain from the end of DEBS3. That ought to make a totally new factory enzyme that might be able to synthesize a totally new natural product. And amazingly, this experiment actually works. It really does produce this predicted chemical compound. But, Unfortunately, the yield of that chemical compound is disappointingly low. It looks like we need to learn a bit more about how factory enzymes work to help us construct designer versions that are more effective.
Well, one way to go about that is to determine the molecular structures of the different enzyme domains that make up each factory enzyme module. And my favorite way of doing that involves nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy or NMR. Now this biophysical technique works on molecules that are dissolved in solution. So it's ideal for proteins that are difficult to crystallize. Now when a protein is uh, placed inside a very strong uniform magnetic field, its hydrogen nuclei start behaving like tiny magnets themselves. And if we tickle those tiny magnets with radio waves, then they begin to oscillate at different frequencies that depend on their chemical environments. So we can interrogate these tiny chemical spies to produce one dimensional NMR spectra, like the one shown at the top in the middle of this slide. This spectrum reports on hundreds of different hydrogen atom environments in our protein. It's also possible to run more sophisticated experiments that measure the separation between pairs of hydrogen atoms in our protein sample, and then use all of those distances we've measured to calculate atomic resolution models of the structure of our protein. Well, going back to the DEBS factory enzyme system for a moment, a key step that happens when the product of one module is passed along so that it becomes the substrate of the next. Now, because DEBS consists of three polypeptide chains, this handover from one module to the next can occur in two different ways. The first type of handover occurs between modules that belong to the same polypeptide chain. This happens four times during the synthesis of erythromycin, represented by the four uh, purple arrows in my slide. But the other two handover events occur between two different polypeptide chains. It happens once between DEBS1 and DEBS2, and then again between DEBS2 and DEBS3. So how does DEBS1 know that it's passing its precious product over to DEBS2 as it should, and not directly onwards to DEBS3 instead by mistake. And how is the correct partner always selected? Well, we solve this problem by using NMR to determine the structures of two regions that appear right at the end of DEBS2 and right at the beginning of DEBS3. We called these regions docking domains. Now there are three alpha helices represented by cylinders here at the end of DEBS2 that form a dimer intertwined with each other. The third helix behaves like the pincers of a crab clamping onto either side of a long coiled coil feature that we detected at the start of DEBS3. So let's focus on how the claws of the DEBS2 pincers clamp onto either side of the DEBS3 coiled coil. Now most of the interface between the pincer helices and the coiled coil turns out to be occupied by sticky non-polar groups represented by the yellow atoms in the middle of this figure. However, we also found pairs of complementary electrostatic interactions between pairs of opposite electrical charges at the top and at the bottom. These correspond to negatively charged carboxylic acid groups that nestle up close to positively charged primary amine groups, forming features that are called salt bridges. Now, if we compare the experimental structure of the interface between DEBS2 and DEBS3 with a model of what we expect to find for a similar interface between DEBS1 and DEBS2, then we can discover something rather interesting. The salt bridges at the top of the interface are the same in each case, but the charges at the bottom are reversed. On the left there, we've got positive charges on DEBS2 attracting negative charges on DEBS3, while on the right, we're predicted to have negative charges on DEBS1 attracting positive charges on DEBS2. So what's the effect of this on the factory enzyme? Well, as expected, DEBS1 should be able to dock successfully onto DEBS2 in order to transfer its substrate. 
and then DEBS2 should be able to dock successfully onto DEBS3 to do the same thing. However, if DEBS1 bumps into a molecule of DEBS3 by mistake, then the charges at the bottom of the docking domain interface won't match each other. Rather than attracting each other, those charges will repel each other. So this won't work. Similarly, incorrect substrate transfer will be prevented if DEBS2 bumps into another copy of DEBS2. It won't be able to pass the substrate on there either because of charge repulsion. So now we've broken the code that controls the transfer of substrates between the different polypeptide chain components of factory enzymes. And knowing this will be useful for designing new assembly lines for making new chemical compounds. And who knows, perhaps some of those new compounds might become the new antibiotics that the world so desperately needs. So before handing over to Daniel, let me just close with a quick summary. I've shown you that polyketide natural products are synthesized by huge factory enzymes and that it's possible to make novel chemical compounds by cutting and pasting factory enzyme genes. I've also shown you that structural information from NMR spectroscopy can help us understand more about how these complicated factory enzymes work. So over to Daniel. Daniel, you're muted. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Nietlisbach. And this afternoon, I have the pleasure to talk to you about the exciting world of membrane proteins and, in particular, G protein coupled receptors. So, you will all be familiar with the observation that you're, if you're pouring oil into a water containing beaker, that the two compounds don't really mix and that the oil or fat or lipids basically form a separate layer which swims on top of the water. And the reason for that is that the oil or the fat contains very long side chains, which are apolar, and they basically don't mix with the polar water molecules. So we say the side chains are hydrophobic, um, hydrophobic and the water molecules are hydrophilic. And therefore they don't mix. And this is a principle which biology uses quite often to make cell walls or membranes which surround individual cells in nature. So the lipid molecules basically arrange in a way where the hydrophobic groups are facing towards each other and are forming this kind of bilayer, which then allows to separate the individual cells from each other. Now, the presence of these membranes is very important for the cell. It provides it with protection. It allows um, individual cells to recognize each other against um, it provides maintenance properties and it also allows to communicate across the membrane bilayer. Um, as you have heard through Bill already, um, when there is a lot of work being involved, typically it is the proteins doing the work. So it will not surprise you that therefore this membrane bilayer does have a lot of proteins which are embedded in this bilayer. Now these proteins are called membrane proteins and they have very special properties because they don't like to mix with water. They are embedded now in this hydrophobic bilayer and they're entirely hydrophobic, so lipid loving. Now these proteins can undertake various different functions. They can bind ligands. They might be acting like what we have just heard through Bill as an en enzyme, which is converting a component into a different one, or they will be allowing um, various different molecules to come across the bilayer into the cell or out of the cell. And myself and my group, we are now very interested 
in investigating these receptor molecules, um, and in particular, these so-called cell surface receptor proteins. Now, these receptor proteins are really the sensors of the cells. They report on changes on the outside of the cell. They communicate then this change across the membrane, and then they instruct basically the interior of the cell to respond to that particular charge. And one special and very, very large group of these receptors now is called G-protein coupled receptors or abbreviated GPCRs. So these receptors are also called serpentine receptor because they snake their way multiple times across the membrane. And they represent a very large family of proteins with over a thousand members in humans. So these GPCRs are really the sensors of the cell. They enable view, hearing, taste, smell, even touch sensation so that we can feel also heat. Um, they influence our mood. Um, overall, I think it is right to say basically that GPCRs are really involved in most of the normal activities in our bodies. And so they are really controlling most of the activities in our body. Now, the question of course is how do these GPCRs work? Now, here you can see the GPCR embedded in the lipid membrane and on the outside of the cell, there will be a range of different molecules, some small molecules, amino acids, drugs, peptides, proteins, and each of, these, each of these GPCR receptors will now be specialized to bind a particular type of ligand. So as soon as this ligand is present outside the cell, it will bind to the receptor, then this will lead to a change in the shape of the, this receptor, which will allow then different coupling proteins a G protein or an arrestin mostly to bind on the inside of the cell to the GPCR. And then this again will allow various other proteins to bind. Um, it will start what we call um, signaling pathways or signaling cascades, which will lead to an amplification of the initial signal. And all of this basically leads to a cellular response. And so this is all a consequence of the initial event of having a particular ligand binding to the receptor. And so the outside, um, spotting the ligand presence on the outside of the cell then translates into a cellular response. So here is an example. So we're having the adenosine receptor, which is embedded in the bilayer, and there is a chemical called adenosine which binds to this particular receptor. And overall, basically this makes us relax. We're very content and we feel very relaxed. However, one nice morning we decide to have a cup of coffee and coffee now contains the chemical caffeine. And caffeine is also a ligand for the adenosine receptor. And in fact, caffeine is a little bit mean because it binds stronger to the adenosine receptor than the, than the adenosine itself. And so it displaces adenosine and basically takes over the control of this receptor. Now, what caffeine does is it stimulates. So in contrary to adenosine leading to relaxation, now when we have caffeine binding this receptor, it leads to stimulation. So basically here we see a very nice example that sometimes we have several ligands which can be competing to bind the one and the same GPCR, but with a different cellular outcome. And so with this in mind, it is easy to realize if the wrong ligand binds a receptor or if the receptor has undergone some unfortunate changes, um, this can very easily lead to multiple diseases. For example, cardiovascular diseases, heart disease, acid reflux, um, depression, migraine, asthma, allergies, and even poisoning. So for example, um, 
cholera toxin leads to poisoning, um, and this all goes via GPCRs. Now, of course, we have many drugs available, and 50% of the current drugs are targeting GPCRs, and these drugs are, of course, here to reduce the effects of these problems or entirely getting rid of these diseases. However, the current drugs, of course, are not perfect at the moment. Um, many diseases are not really targeted. And to some extent, this is because currently only about 20% of GBCRs are targeted by drugs. Very often, the effect of a drug is all or nothing. So it's like this on or off. And a lot of the drugs have many side effects as well. Now, what we would imagine an improved drug would be providing is that it will be able to target untreated diseases, so diseases for which currently there is no cure, that they will have less side effects, and that they are also finer tuned. And the side effect issue is one we can understand quite easily because this is to do, once the drug binds a GPCR, it might lead to signaling via two competing pathways. And one of the pathways has the wanted therapeutic effect, but the other pathway would go via the adverse effect. Now, if we can develop a new drug which only signals via and activates the therapeutic effect and suppresses the other one, then very clearly we'll have, we'll have much less side effects through that. Okay, so what I call here a, a road to better drugs basically requires that we need to understand um, the basics of how these G-protein coupled receptors work. So how can binding of a small ligand on the outside of the cell lead to this change in shape across the membrane of the bilayer? Um, so how can ligand binding activate the receptor? And are there differences amongst these GPCRs? And one thing we need to appreciate is that while a lot of these pictures um, show the GPCRs basically as a static entity, um, what it does turn out is that GPCRs in reality are really dynamic. So rather than taking pictures of these receptors, so to speak, it would be much better if we were able to take, to do a movie and to film how they are behaving in solution. Now, scientifically, this is something very difficult to do at atomic resolution. However, NMR is to, to some extent can get there and can provide some of that dynamic, dynamic information on receptors. So if we really want to invest these G-protein coupled receptors now by NMR, what we need to do is we need to make these receptors first, we express them, and then we label them with NMR probes. So these are our spies, and you can see them here on a structure of a GPCRs as red little blobs. So each of these red um, spies are visible in an NMR spectrum, and then we record basically the data. On the right-hand side here, you can see a so-called NMR spectrum, which Bill already introduced. And you can see that NMR here is not just like, it's not like a super high resolution um, microscopy methodology. Um, it doesn't show us um, a zoom in of a molecule. It is what we call an indirect method. And what we are obtaining basically is a map where we see each of the spy molecules as a blob on the spectrum. And the position of these signals um, is very sensitive to the environment and to changes in the environment. And these are exactly the properties which we now can use when we are investigating these receptors. So I'm showing you here a case study of the adrenergic receptor. And we are overlaying two spectra here. First one in blue is, based, is the adrenergic receptor without a ligand. So you can see many of these well-resolved signals. And then we're adding a ligand called adrenaline and the receptor binds this adrenaline. 
Now, adrenaline is a hormone and it is very much responsible for our fight or flight response of the body. So once the bear comes out behind the tree, basically this is when adrenaline kicks in that makes us run away, hopefully rather than fighting the bear. Um, so it increases heart rate, it contracts blood, and it leads to a general increase in energy production. So this is what adrenaline does. And as you can see, we do have some local changes in the spectrum. So NMR is able to pick up how the receptor is changing when we are binding this adrenaline ligand. So what we're now doing is we are just watching one particular signal, one spy um, position on this receptor. And we have seen already the blue and the pink spectrum. So this is the inactive non-ligand form. And when we bind the native adrenaline ligand, then we end up in this pink form. And what we can then further do is we can investigate the effect of a range of drugs, which are so-called beta blockers. So beta blockers are typical drugs which will be taken by a person who might have had a heart attack or he, who has some vascular issues. And the beta blockers have the effect to basically reduce the blood pressure and or reduce the heart rate. And what you can see now is that these beta blockers position themselves in between the two extreme, in between either the fully active um, receptor on the right hand side here or the unliganded form on the left hand side. So we know we do have an equilibrium between these two forms and depending on what beta blocker we are binding, we are shifting now this equilibrium. In fact, this methodology works so well that then we can correlate the position of these different peaks of these beta blockers with the activity of the receptor. And that gives us this unique property that um, someone might come, give us a sample of an unknown beta blocker. We can study this by NMR and through the position then of this peak, we will immediately be able to say what the properties of this particular beta blocker are. So it is a very sensitive and a very quantitative method to investigate the effect of ligands and to be able to classify them according to their action. So we can go a little bit further even here. Um, as you remember, when I introduced the GPCRs to you, I mentioned that we have these extracellular ligands binding, and then this leads to coupling of a G protein with the GPCR. Now we can investigate this here by NMR, and this is what you can see in the red box here. There are, for each of the ligands, we are investigating, there are two peaks, a sharper one on the right-hand side and a broader one on the left-hand side, which is gradually increasing when we are using more activating ligand. So the peak on the left is basically this, this uh, receptor coupled to the intercellular um, signaling protein, the G protein. And so we're getting more and more of that protein as we're now moving towards the more activating ligand. So if we're looking at our little um, equilibrium between the blue and the pink form of the receptor, then we can see now that it's only the active form of the receptor, which is basically able then to couple to the G protein. And the amount of G protein coupled is nicely correlating again with the activity of the receptor. So the amount of bound G protein basically parallels, again, the cellular activity. So basically, we're able to investigate these things in vitro. And this is a start of our studies. And there is, of course, much more coming. But this was basically to try to um, tell you about the very basics, how we can investigate um, these avenues using NMR. So I have here a, a second part of the summary. Um, so GPCRs are the sensors of the cell. Many drugs target membrane proteins and in particular GPCRs. Um, structural studies using NMR allows to understand how GPCRs work. And this molecular insight will hopefully help us to develop new drugs which have improved properties 
and that will um, allow us to treat new diseases for which there is no cure currently. Okay, Iris, over to you. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you very much, Daniel. That was really interesting to see two completely different research applications for a single research technique. So that was fascinating, thank you. Um, so we're now gonna have our live question and answer session. So if you have any questions, if you could please post this in the live chat on YouTube, and then we'll try and answer as many of your questions as we can get through. Um, there is a slight delay though, between what we're saying on Zoom and you hearing us on YouTube. So that means I get to ask the first questions so that we're not just sitting in silence. And um, so a couple of, I guess, fundamental questions for the bill. Um, and it's an easy one to start with. So why do bacteria produce antibiotics if antibiotics kill bacteria? It's a really good question, actually, Reese. Uh, and the true answer is that we don't really know. OK, um, but we've got a few ideas. So it may be that some bacteria produce antibiotics to kill off their neighbours so they can steal their food, things like that, give themselves a competitive advantage. Uh, that's a really nice idea, except most bacteria actually produce antibiotics in quite low concentrations that wouldn't be enough to kill off their neighbours. So it might be something else. It might be something to do with different types of bacteria communicating with each other um, so that uh, they can uh, work out how to survive together. Um, but it's a really good question that I don't think anybody really knows the answer to. Uh, some content for a future talk, maybe. And <laughs> <laughs> um, as I was could you explain what you mean by synthetic biology? Oh, okay. Well, synthetic biology um, is really an, uh, an an effort to say, okay, well, we know lots of biology now, but you only really understand things when you try and build something yourself. Uh, and so the overall idea might be to try to make a living cell just from chemicals, okay? Uh, that might be one way of thinking about synthetic biology. Uh, another way of thinking about synthetic biology, which is a bit, bit closer to what I was describing in my talk, was let's use the, um, the, the, uh, the, the tools of biology, enzymes and things like that, to make interesting compounds. And rather than letting the bug or the plant decide what compounds to make, we get to decide. And so we put all the bits and bobs together and try and make a biosynthetic pathway that might actually work, okay? And this actually has a major implications for what you might call green chemistry. So at the moment, lots of ways of producing important chemicals that we need for everyday life are really quite polluting of the environment. But if we can get uh, bacteria uh, or fungi or plants to do some of this work for us, they'll be able to do it at low temperatures, at normal pressure, uh, without using horrible polluting solvents. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in using synthetic biology to, uh, to do that kind of thing. So if we have, uh, what's the best way of phrasing this, we have uh, normal, uh, natural bacteria producing antibiotics, and we have the option of having uh, new antibiotics developed through synthetic biology. Um, in your opinion, which is going to be the, where are the next generation of antibiotics going to come from? Would it be synthetic biology and man-made new antibiotics, or antibiotics that we've discovered in some remote area of the world? Yeah, well, um, basically, we, we, we don't know, but we've really got to try uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to solve this. Now, the thing about the sorts of polyketide natural products that I've been talking about is that they have been designed by evolution to do interesting biochemical tasks. And so it could be argued that they have a, a sort of a privileged ability to, uh, to develop interesting biological functions. Uh, now, lots of people who uh, run drug companies would totally disagree with that. And they say, oh, these molecules are far too large. They disagree with all of the rules for how to get drugs inside cells, but they still work anyway, actually. And, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're still difficult to beat, it turns out. So it might be either a new type of natural product that we haven't discovered before or 
some, some variation on that theme that we can make by synthetic biology. So one of the things that's been discovered because we're able to look at the complete genomes of bacteria very easily now um, is that many of the bacteria that produce natural products that have been really important, like erythromycin, actually have secret biosynthetic clusters that we didn't know about. And so we might be able to activate some of those sleeping biosynthetic cl um, clusters to make new compounds and then test what those are going to do. And would those be sort of evolutionary remnants or is these things that we just just genuinely didn't know? Well, they, it could be that we just haven't been growing up the bugs under the right conditions so that they actually make these things. But it turns out that there's a, that there's a large repertoire out there um, that we can uh, that we can harvest. And uh, people are starting to look at environmental DNA now um, so that uh, you um there are lots of bugs that we don't know how to culture in the laboratory, uh, and uh, but we can now get genome information about them uh, just by sampling DNA from the environment. And so people are discovering more and more of these clusters uh, uh, at, a, at a great rate. And uh, other than antibiotics, what other types of molecules might be, might be might that, sorry, other than antibiotics, what other types of molecules might we be able to make through synthetic? Oh, all kinds, really. I mean, some of the uh, other sorts of drugs that uh, uh, natural products produce uh, um, will um, disrupt the um, uh, um, the cytoskeleton inside our cells, which will stop uh, cells from changing shape. And this can be really important as an anti-cancer sort of drug. Um, and there are um, colleagues in the United States at the moment who are trying to work out how to make nylon um, in uh, more nylon precursors in bacteria. Uh, and nylon's actually you know, hugely important synthetic fabric for, for clothes that we wear, but it really has produced an awful lot of pollution. So if we could uh, work out how to do that in a green chemistry way using bacteria, that would be a really good thing. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, there's a question on YouTube, which I presume uh, is probably for Daniel to answer. Um, so you showed how you can predict where a drug might be on an activity continuum. However, it seemed that these were for existing proteins. So how would you tackle a new protein? That's right. So, so that will involve quite a lot of work, of course, because you would have to canvas um, how the situation is for your unknown um, receptor. And so basically you will have to go out there and investigate this for a multitude of different receptors. And you will have to repeat basically that game. Um, so, of course, it is very easy to do for particular receptors like adrenergic receptors because there's a lot of drugs available already. But, of course, this is not the case for, for every receptor and many receptors, um, their function are not known currently either. What you're doing. So it's not that straightforward, but um, we need to start with the easy ones. Yeah, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of drugs, actually, uh, so I think you showed, uh, was it adenosine and caffeine that compete mm -hmm. for the same yes. Yes. protein coupled receptor? So if we take, we take caffeine as a stimulant in our tea and our coffee, could we then conversely take adenosine to help us relax at the end of the day? I'm not 100% sure how big the difference in, in binding affinity is at the moment. So of course, this is can be a little bit tricky, but... Um, in principle, if you could displace the caffeine, then you could, of course, reverse its effect. Absolutely, that's how it works. Okay. And uh, staying on G protein coupled receptors, actually, um, just a slightly simpler question. Um, how did we end up with so many? Well, the, the um, it's actually an interesting question and the, the whole field is a little bit still has um is not entirely answered yet because there's lots of microbial receptors also which look very similar to g protein coupled receptors and it's not quite clear if the nature if nature basically has come up with the same formula twice um it's um Supposedly, they just have proven to be a very efficient formula where relatively small modifications can be implemented um, and which allow basically them to, to work as, as very um, careful and very sensitive sensors um, using a similar formula where they're um, 
binding ligands. Saying that, however, there is quite a bit of uh, variation between these receptors um, in their shape, complexity also. So the ones I was showing were basically the most simple ones. They don't they basically traverse the membrane um, seven times, um, but then there is other receptors also which have extracellular and the intracellular domains, which are quite large and which then offer a little bit more variety. And where there, you, you might come to the conclusion that maybe um, the, it has moved a little bit further away from these um, basic GPCRs and there is more um, um, a way to play, uh, there's more, um, opportunity to play just based on ligand binding, protein, protein interactions, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's, a, not a, uh, it's not an answer which is, is easy to give. I think it's not clear at the moment, really. Yeah. The ones that, the ones that are similar, so you, you had that slide that showed that the, the g protein coupled receptors are pretty much involved in all normal um, processes. So, uh, touch, smell, uh, sight, and so on. The ones that are similar, can you get sort of accidental crosstalk or, or mutations that cause crosstalk where maybe you would smell something but because you have a mutant receptor, it feels like you're touching something? So I think some kind of like uh, synesthesia type effect. Well, it, it, I mean, we, we need to keep in mind that, that the whole process is more complex and, and basically the, the GPCR is at the tip of the iceberg if you want so. So it's the ligand which binds but then there is a very complex machinery which is being kicked off inside the cell. Uh, multiple pathways, multiple cross-talking pathways, etc. So um, it is more complicated than that of course. So I don't think this is quite so simple but but just to say, I mean, uh, lots of the receptors, for example, do interact, um, form heterodimer um, or hetero um, oligomers interact amongst each other. So it can be that one receptor can activate another one. So it needs first one ligand to bind to activate a receptor, which is in principle binding a different type of ligands and so on. So it, it can be very, very complicated. Um, that would be a, that would be a lot of fun if we could sort of um, uh, um, con a, a receptor into doing something differently. Of course, um, I think within a relatively narrow um, range, it is possible. So, for example, um, the adrenergic receptor I was talking exists in in many um, quite similar forms, and um, they're called beta one, beta two, alpha one, alpha two. Um, they're not too far from each other, but they're, they're achieving slightly different purposes. Um, sometimes it's also that their, their distribution within, um, within the, the body is, is just varying. So depending on where the receptor is, in what kind of cell type, it will do a slightly, uh, a slightly different um, thing also. Thank you very much. Uh, Latika, do you have any questions or anything you wanted to add? Um, I think you kind of asked my question with the adenosine and caffeine uh, uh, interaction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess, so um, another thing you mentioned was with medications. And uh, so, for example, I'm on antidepressants. How exactly is that uh, working uh, to, to help my condition? So... It, there is varying types of, of antidepressants. So there is antidepressants which act on, on GPCRs, but there is other antidepressants which are working on channels. Um, so one would have to look more carefully into that. Yeah. But very often it's, it's just a, a blocking event that basically prevents other ligands, so other stimulating um, ligands to, to bind and, and do their, uh, basically un uh, prevent them from doing their unwanted action. I see, okay. Blockage is the word. <laughs> it's quite blunt. <laughs> Not the nicest word, actually, blockage. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have time for one last question, so I'm going to ask something uh, controversial. So on Friday, we had a talk from Dr. Marco Hyvonen on X-ray crystallography. And we asked Marco why X-ray crystallography is the best of the structural biology techniques. So 
to both of you, um, why NMR? Why is NMR the best technique? I think uh, overall, it, we, we'd say it's a complementary technique. I mean, X-ray crystallography is great because it can be really accurate, um, but uh, and very high resolution. But the problem is you've got to be able to make crystals, otherwise you can't do any crystallography at all. Um, and so NMR is really good for things that you can't crystallize. Uh, and this can um, turns out to be uh, lots of proteins uh, contain floppy bits, uh, uh, which don't crystallize very nicely. Uh, and these sort of regions were called um, intrinsically unstructured domains of proteins turn out to be really very important parts of proteins in higher mammals like humans. OK, so uh, so there's some proteins that uh, X-ray crystallography just can't touch at all. Um, and then I think some of the things that Daniel was mentioning are also really important as well. So X-ray crystallography is great for giving you those static snapshots of what might be going on. Um, but NMR has got an ability to, um, uh, some of its properties depend on protein motions. Uh, and so you can, uh, you, you can really start to uh, investigate the dynamics, uh, revealing things that, that, that X-ray crystallography can't, uh, can't tell you. Uh, now, I, I guess we're all um, working out how to address the elephant in the room as well, which is cryo-electron microscopy, which is, which is in, the, in the last few years has become a much more uh, um, tractable technique for, uh, for, for, for getting uh, structural information. That also really just relies on, on, on coming up with uh, static snapshots, though. Yes, Anything yes. Anything else we should and, add? Uh, Yes, and, and I, I think also that um, maybe in structural biology, we have spent a lot of time concentrating um, what we say the main conformation a, a molecule um, adopts, right? And, and typically crystallography will always um, show you the main conformation, but this might not necessarily be the one which is pharmaceutically active. And, and so there might just be one or two percent maybe of a, a the protein being in an alternative conformation, but this actually does turn out to be the important one or be the one which will be targeted by the drug. And so if you try to model in a drug, um, you will not be able to do that because you, you don't have this conformation accessible in crystallography. Well, by NMR, it is possible to see very low um, amounts of alternative conformation. And the same, same we believe is true for lots of enzymes as well. They have a ground state conformation, which is what they, uh, the, the, the shape that they adopt most of the time. But in order to catalyze their reaction, they might need a little kick of energy to get up to a, a slightly different conformation. Uh, and uh, this is something that can be probed by NMR, but not by, uh, but not by X-ray crystallography. But Bill was, uh, said something very important. And I think this is, I, I can only... Um, on, on the writers in, entirely is that it's a very complementary game and, and that one really should use all the technique available to get as much on information as, as possible and that the information is really complementary and will add to the picture and will possibly give you new leads which you were not aware about previously. So it's, it's not a race who is better or um, clearly there are um, you know, we understand when it's better to use one technique over another one, but this is still not an excuse to um, um, conduct an uh, investigation by using several methods. But sometimes life is just too short and then we focus on one uh, and don't do the other one or leave it to someone else to do that. <laughs> I think that's a very fair answer. <laughs> um, we have a talk from uh, Dr. Amanda Chaplin tomorrow on cryo-electron microscopy. So I think we'll ask her the same question. <laughs> Great. So uh, with that, I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, so firstly, Bill and Daniel, thank you very much for very interesting talks and for a very interesting discussion as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank Latika for helping me out behind the scenes again with running this afternoon's talk. No problem. Hopefully, um, I would just want to apologise why I ran off screen. There was a massive wasp in my office that I just wanted to get rid of. So That was <laughs> fight and flight. That. It was the adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> G-protein coupled receptors in action. <laughs> cool. uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for watching at home. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to join us again tomorrow for our final Cambridge Festival talk on cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, so have a nice